back to a preliminary castle of Sierra. This is the only language art 600, book 9. Your view from the back of my classroom. Okay, 6th grade, book 9, lesson 1, appreciating poetry. Uh, I'll read you a poem by Casey at the bat. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville 9 that day. The score stood 4 to 2 with what but one inning more to play. And then old Cooney died at first, and Barrows did the same. A sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to that hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. And the former was a Lulu and the latter was a cake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and men saw what had occurred, there stood Jimmy, safe at second, and Flynn hugging third. Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the plat for Casey. Mighty Casey was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then, while the ringing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye and a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it with haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batman, the ball, unheeded, sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spear flew. But Casey still ignored it. And the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened, cried the maddened thousands, and echo entered fraud. But one scornful look from Casey and the audience was all. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let the ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball. And now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in that favored land the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. How many strikes do you get in the ball? Three. Three, Three strikes. Did he hit his last ball in the game? Yeah, but he did He tried, but did he get it? His back neck? No. Why do you think he let the first two go? Do you think he intentionally didn't hit them? He obviously just didn't even hit. Why didn't he hit them? He said the first one, he said, not my style. Do you think Casey's a humble person? No. Do you think that, so, do you think he was, he was sure he was going to hit that last one? Yeah, he was sure. Yeah, he's very sure. I think he was so sure that the first two, he was like, he's just going to put it up for the last strike, you know, so that he gets to make a bigger splash, you know. If he hits it on the first one, then that's what everyone expected, but he's going to really show off. He's going to go to the third one. And on the third one, he and this. Um, that's a very famous poem about Lady Casey. Here's another poem about 
railroad crossing. I think I've read you this one before. I can't tell much about the thing. Twas done so powerful quick. But appears to me I got a most outlandish heavy leg. It broke my leg and tore my sculpt and jerked my arm most out. But take a seat, I'll try and tell just how it came about. You see, I started down to town with that air team of mine, a hauling down a load of corn for Ebenezer Klein, and driving slow for just about a day or two before the off horse run a splinter in his foot and made it sore. You know the railroad cuts across the road at Martin's Hole? Well, bar I seed a great big sign raised high upon a pole. I thought I'd stop and read the thing and find out what it said. And so I stopped the horses on the railroad track and read. I ain't no scholar, recollect, and so I had to spell. It's, I started kind of cautious, like with R, A, I, and L. And that spelt rail as clear as mud. R, O, A, D was road. I lumped them. Railroad was the word, and that air much I know. C R O and double S and with I N G to boot made crossing just as plain as Noah Webster dared to do it. Railroad crossing, good enough. L double O and K. Look! And I was looking all the time and spelling like a book. O U T spelled out just right. And there was look out. It's kind of curious like to know just what was all about. F O R and T H E was then look out for the and then I tried the next word. It commenced with E and G. I got that word. When suddenly there came an awful whack. A thousand fiery thunderbolts just scooped me off the track. The horses went to Davy Jones. The wagon went to smash. And I was hissed seven yards above the tallest ash. I didn't come to life again for about a day or two. But though I'm crippled up a heap, I sort of struggled through. It ain't the pain, or ain't the loss of that there team of mine, but stranger, how I'd like to know the rest of that air sign. What do you think it says? Ambient way back. Poems are fun. They're, they're interesting. They read nicely. They're easy to memorize, much easier than stories, because they have a rhythm, and they have a rhyme, and they fit with our souls. We just read them, they, they stick in our brains, they're easy to memorize. Your brains right now, especially, are at a point where they're very, very flexible and moldable and can easily memorize poems. When I was about your age, my sister said, I started memorizing the poems, like this poem, and like Papa's letter, and like the other poems we were talking about. And my sister said, you should memorize the long poem, you should memorize the ballad of the harp weaver. And that's what I memorized, the ballad of the harp weaver. Son said my mother when I was knee high, you've needed clothes to cover you, and not a rag have I. There's nothing in the house to make a boy breeches, nor shears to cut the cloth with, nor thread to take stitches. There's nothing in the house but a loaf and of rye, and a harp for the woman's head no one will buy. And she began to cry. That was in the early fall, and when came late fall, son, she said, the very sight of you makes your mother's blood crawl. Little skinny shoulder blades sticking through your clothes, and where you'll get a jacket from? God above knows. It's lucky for me, lad, your daddy's in the ground. I can't see the way I let his son go around. And she made a queer sound. That was in the late fall, and when the winter came, I had not a pair of breeches nor a shirt to my name. I couldn't go to school or out of doors to play, and all the other little boys passed our way. Son, said my mother, come climb into my lap, and I'll chafe your little bones while you take a nap. And oh, we were silly for half an hour or more, me with my long legs a-dragging on the floor, a rock, rock, rock into a mother goose rhyme. Oh, but we were silly for half an hour's time. But there was I, a great boy, and what would folks say to see my mother rocking me to sleep all day in such a dump? 
Men say the winter was bad that year. Fuel was scarce and food was dear. The wind with the wolf's head howled about our door and we burned up the chairs and sat upon the floor. All that was left us was a chair we couldn't break and the heart with the woman said no one would take for song or pity sake. The night before Christmas, I cried with the cold. I cried myself to sleep like a two-year-old. But deep within the night, I felt my mother rise and stare down upon me with love in her eyes. And there she was sitting on that one good chair, a light falling on her from I couldn't tell where, looking 19 and not a day older, with the heart with the woman's head leaned against her shoulder. Her thin fingers moving through its thin, tall strings were weave, weave, weaving wonderful things. And many bright threads from where I couldn't see came running through the heartstrings rapidly. The gold thread whistling through my mother's hand, I saw the web grow and the pattern expand. She wove a child's jacket, and when it was done, she laid it on the floor and wove another one. She wove a pair of mittens. She wove a little blouse. She wove all night in the still cold house. She sang as she worked, and the harp strings spoke. Her voice never faltered, and the thread never broke. And when I awoke, there sat my mother with a harp against her shoulder. Looking 19, and not a day older. A smile about her lips, and a light about her head, and her hands on the harp strings, frozen, dead. But piled up beside her, and toppling to the sky, were the clothes of a king's son, just my size. Archie, Dad. Now, I missed two verses in there. There's a few verses that I, I forgot. Um, that's a long poem. You can memorize it easily. You can memorize the whole book of First John if you wanted to. You can memorize the whole book of James if you wanted to. Your brains are young and... and very flexible. You should be using them because when, oh, you yeah, memorize, when you memorize this stuff, you'll never forget it and you'll never regret it. I'll read the spelling words and then I'll let you go. Biped, centipede, composition, construction, definition, destination, addition, expedition, explanation, fiction, infection, intersection, octopus, pedestal, pedestrian, Pedigree, platypus, quadruple, suggestion, tripod. <laughs> wow. Well, the pest, the hundred said. Oh, what? Pedestrian. Pedestrian. Someone who has peds. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> we are bipeds. That means we have two feet. A pedestrian has peds, feet, peds, 